Uh, thank you, Emily, and thank you all for coming along tonight. The suburbs, where we come from. More than a decade ago, I moved from inner city Brunswick to Kangaroo Ground on the outer fringes of Greater Melbourne. At night, from a high ridge near my place, you can look far into the distance and see, as darkness falls, a fabulous city arise. Its skyline festooned with twinkling lights. The city, human civilization's most extraordinary artefact, a magnet, a promise, a dream. The city, burning with energy, an engine of consumption and desire. And for the first time in human history, more people globally now live in cities than in the country. A crucial balance has tipped. Every year as I observe Melbourne from my vantage point, the suburbs spill and sprawl ever further, ever outwards towards me. Australia's coast-hugging cities are all built for compelling reasons of geography and climate on temperate rain belts, coastal strips sweeping down and around the continental map. We are the ultimate urban and suburban people. In 2013, 20.5 million out of a national population of 23 million, or nearly 90% of us, live in or close to big cities. And in Melbourne, it seems it's always been just one long peak hour rush. Marvellous Melbourne. So dubbed after the 1850s gold rush, when for a brief time it was the fastest growing city in the world. I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s in the birthing grounds of the baby boomers. It was the post-war boom years, when growth was helped by immigration and a suburban explosion took place. Melbourne's newcomers post-war were mainly from the Mediterranean, the Balkans, Greece and Italy. Even today, 47% of all Greek Australians live in Melbourne, an Athens of the South. Whitlam arrived in 1972 and Newness arrived with him, knocking loudly on the suburban doorstep. Colour TV, sexual freedom, feminism. Back then, we bought the white goods, US-style consumerism, fondues, the cocktail hour. We became materialistic and pleasure-seeking down to our bootstraps, and still are. The logic of a settler culture, transforming land into property, stretching the famous grid structure of Melbourne like an elastic fabric ever outward and over the contours of former farmland. The inexorable cookie cutter logic, subdividing nature into culture, into the streets, quarter acre blocks, backyards and barbies of the Australian suburban dream. We even seemed for a while in the grip of a new gold rush during the get rich quick crazy credit bubble Howard years. Snap up houses on credit, sell overnight for a profit, move on. Gold, gold, gold in your own backyard. This was the McMansion era, which author Janet Hawley describes as the biggest house on the smallest block for the lowest price. That's the rationale behind the new suburbia, complete with triple garages, faux facades and tiny backyards. Lay a concrete slab and build a cavernous trophy home in 20 weeks. Arise, Clancy, of the overdraft on your never-never acres of maxed-out debt. 
heirs to what some critics have dubbed affluenza. Treatment for this disease proved harsh, a nasty jab from Wall Street. I think a few nasty pricks from Wall Street, actually. <laughs> Our suburban rush stalled when the GFC hit, sending a worrying pong down our air conditioners. Even fears of mortgage meltdowns west of Sydney, briefly crueling the old sales pitch. The GFC brought a cautionary pause, then confidence returned as interest rates fell. Look around, it's still happening. You see it everywhere. The sprawl and low density now only partially offset by medium density urban infill. Melbourne, we are told, now has one of the largest urban footprints in the world, stretching 100 kilometres from east to west. Melbourne is now Australia's fastest growing capital and with the nation's fastest growing suburb, South Morang, 23 kilometres from the centre. Where does Melbourne begin and end? Does it end? It all depends on where you draw the boundaries. Some claim that in sheer geographical size, we are already the eighth largest city in the world, with 4.2 million people laying their string lines across a slab of real estate bigger than Metro London. And will satellite city Geelong eventually merge with Melbourne into one gigantic megaburg with the lot. Melbourne has already outgrown its CBD. It's simply too big. So epicentres have arisen. Chadston, Northland, Southland, Eastland, Fountaingate. These small glass mini cities within our city have supplemented in patronage as well as dwarfed in size the old AFL stadium still dotted around Melbourne, which no longer host games. Our shopping meccas, bright and resplendent high points across the city's map, flames to attract mortgage moths. Of course, the MCG still remains Melbourne's combination Vatican come Colosseum, a site of worship, heroism, and ritual bruising. The only, the one place where everyone can stand up, wave fists, shout and vent aggression in an acceptable way. A bowl of pumped up footy theatre, noise and marketing, awash with testosterone. The simple catharsis of footy, some say, is the very reason why the other side of Melbourne's coin spins so brightly. I mean our cultural side. A ritual winter venting cleanses us of our demons, the poor demons, allowing a deeper civilization to flourish in our collective being. In galleries, theatres, bookshops, graffiti lanes, fragrant with latte, the nation's intellectual and artistic centre is Melbourne. But critics say our suburbs foster sameness and enforce conformity. It's where wage slaves get hobbled with debt, become conservative and not a little ugly, imagining boatloads of asylum seekers might suddenly rock up with semi-trailers and make off with everything. This is the dark view of the suburbs. Perhaps one all too real in those raw boned streets lined with hoppers of building waste where quick buck developers sell off the plan and quickly move on, leaving punters stranded and isolated without infrastructure or transport in yet another billboard fronted carve up at the margins of the Melways. 
But look again. And there is another story, a much better one to be told. The suburbs, it could be argued, have brought great benefits into the fabric of Australian social life. Benefits of stability, harmony and social integration. The suburbs are an engine of social transformation, fostering lives of opportunity and happiness. They are places of empowerment, particularly for the young, as stability allows unbroken years of education. Australia's most multicultural city, Melbourne, now has people from 180 countries speaking more than 150 languages and more than half of us now born overseas or with one overseas born parent. The stability and privacy of our suburbs and perhaps their very uniformity has paradoxically also fostered a massive happy, almost frictionless intake of people from every corner of the globe. Yes, we associate Italians with Carlton, Chinese with Box Hill, Vietnamese with Richmond, North Africans with Flemington and so on, but we don't see any serious ghettoisation. Local differences are very welcome and not just in the cuisine sense add an extra zingy flavour to our lives. Lately, we have been urged to reach for the sky, to stop the horizontal outrush and climb up into apartments of glass and steel. But Melbourne's recent ascent to strata spheric life, evident in the fast-growing Docklands precinct, has also brought problems. TV studios, Etihad, marinas, yes. But where, residents demand, are the schools, creches, medical facilities, places to meet and mingle, institutions to mitigate isolation, to confirm community? Back on the outer fringes, similar questions arise. How many new suburbs can we still reasonably plonk way out there or service? Won't building on our best agricultural land just push food prices up? Is the water supply sustainable, even with that white elephantine diesel plant? As for transport, well, if you plan to cross Melbourne by car, Pack a seat case and provisions for a week. A tent would be handy. And the train? What train? Money you save by building on the fringes, you blow on petrol to get there. Well, get there eventually. Until we develop cheaper, greener technology to offset our car overuse, fossil fuels just add to global warm warming trailing all that CO2 behind us down our highways. My home is on the Green Wedge, the so-called lungs of Melbourne, and its beautiful high conservation open spaces help, helps make Melbourne stay marvellous. Just as the parklands, public spaces and leafy boulevards do nearer the CBD, it would be short-sighted vandalism to sell any of this off just for a few budget balancing bucks. Despite its very real challenges, Melbourne has twice been voted the most livable city in the world. I couldn't agree more. I also believe it is our most lovable city. To explain why, Let's look at one iconic place we have probably all been to at some time and which, for me, embodies our city's considerable virtues, the Queen Victoria Market. Spread over seven hectares within the CBD, the Queen Vic 
duplicates horizontally but in miniature the open sprawl of the city that it serves. It's a place of vitality, colour and cultural diversity, a democratic space of endless welcome. On market mornings there is much shouting and camaraderie, a sort of theatre of everyday life, a pulse spectacularly reflecting the ethnic mix of Melbourne. The market offers a grassroots grounding at a meat and potatoes level in basic commerce, the chance to set up in business, an invitation to participate, to circulate freely, to enter into human scale exchange and many-sided community. Finally, have we now the cultural self-confidence to set our legends and stories in our unique suburban reality? Are we able to claim Melbourne now as a world city? Are we grown up enough for that? Look at recent movie making here and the answer just might be yes. In the past 35 years, 124 movies, amazingly, were made or set in moody Melbourne. Impressive enough, but more than half since the year 2000. One of my favourite recent movies was even set in wonderful, daggy, atmospheric Collingwood back streets. Now that's confidence for you. How far we have come.